Hey, you there. Thank you for watching and welcome to Forge Lines Forever. Today I have a 5v5 custom match here on the most amazing across this map generator. So let's go ahead and introduce our teams and players, starting with Team 1 up here to the northwest and ending with Team 2 down here in the southeast. I'm going to slow it down just a little bit just to ensure we don't miss any of the opening action. We're going to start here with the frontline player of Team 1. It is Signal Runner going first land as a UEF in Snow White. In the middle slot, most likely Eco, probably, if not this kind of like middle section over here. He is this the Chevy Crimson player of Kabanov. Kabanov? Kabanov? I think that's how you say that. Going first, land as a Seraphim, and again in Chevy Crimson. To his west in Tropical Ocean Blue, we have Clinch going first, land as a Cybrin, and again, he's probably going to be one of the air slots, if not, probably kind of a hybrid of a land and an air slot, but the most likely air player here, 14 one, it is Hell Virus going first, land as a Cybrin as well in Royal Blue, and the last player on the one to introduce is Trigram for Heaven, probably call him Tri or Heaven, one of the two names, I don't know which one I will end up sticking with but we'll have to see as time goes on going first land most likely second air I feel like a lot of players now kind of go second air just in general just to have access to bombers and interceptors and that sort of thing and again he is in stitch blue as an aeon that is team one team one has all of the factions represented here with a duplicate of a cybrin so they have two telemajor comms on the, like not on the books but possibilities here for team one down here in the southeast for team two already on the move a couple of comms we have one zero cat i don't know if that's a reference to schrodinger scout or anything but one zero cat he is going first land as an aeon in emerald green to his west also on the move we have luca the highest rated player in the game by a decent margin about 400 points of reigning going first land in ruby red as a uef to his west, another Cybern on the front line here for the game. We have a Maverick going first land in Forest Green. Very sensible color for this game. Unfortunately, it is going to blend in a little bit with that environment, so apologies to those who struggle with uh, not necessarily color blindness, but like can't see certain shades when they conflict with one another. Apologies for that. To the southeast, we have Drunken Drunk Warden, not Drunken Warden, Going first, land second air in Royal Blue as a Cybern. And the other Cybern here for Team 2, Prugler PDM. Going first, land second air as well in Lightest Red Pink. So for Team 2 side of things, we also have all of the races represented here for Team 2 with a duplicate in Cybern faction. So it is a 1v1, you know, one of each faction on both teams with an additional Cybern commander. That is pretty even. I haven't seen that in actually a pretty long time. We'll have to see how that plays out for both of our teams. It looks like all of the comms here for Team 1, except for the rear guard, is leaving the main base. Similar thing happening, except for the lightish red player of Prugler PDM is staying in his base for now, but I wouldn't be surprised. He is on the move as well. So it does look like the rear guard air slot players for both teams will stay in their relatively main bases for now. We have a little bit more of aggressive play here from the Snow White player of Signal Runner going for this mass, not going to, you know, follow Maverick's lead. is kind of stay with this quad mex formation here. And in terms of mass and mexes, let's take a look at Reclaim here pretty soon. We have eight, oh, is that 18,000? Uh, it's at 17,000. I'm going to put the game back up to zero. And again, about 17,000. So about, what is that, three-fourths? Two-thirds about the way of a a monkey. So not a whole lot, but still a decent amount for 10 players to scoop up. We have the first plasma balls thrown at one another between Signal Runner and Maverick as they are scooping up mass. In the middle, both of the red players in this game are meeting up in a very similar situation here in the middle. We are seeing movement here to the northeast from these edge players of, let's see, that is Try and that is 1-0 Cat. Very interesting name, 1-0 Cat. Don't know if that's a reference to anything. Maybe that's 10 cats because of 1-0, but I don't really know. 
It is a different a different name for sure. The signal runner is on the retreat. He does have more hit points versus the Maverick just by 500. Not a whole lot, but, you know, every little bit counts. We are seeing the rearguard air slot player of Team 2's Drunken drunk Warden. I'm going to say Drunken Warden. I know it's going to be wrong, but it's just going to come out as Drunken Warden, so I apologize for my eventual, like, saying it wrong multiple times later on. But Kabanov and Luko are throwing plasma at one another. One is a Cybern, sorry, Seraphim. One is a UEF. The UEF player is actually the one that is down in the yellow sub, let's say, almost 8,000 hit points versus Kabanov at almost sub 9,000. It could be a murder-suicide situation here for the middle of the map. But again, similar thing happening to the west as well. But they look a lot more healthy than their compatriots here in the middle. We have the assistant Drunken Warden moving northward, and the main base of Team 1 does house one commander left. It is Hellvirus. He's not moving that front line as of yet, and I don't think he will at this point. Uh, I mean, maybe, but I don't really see it from now on. We are having, again, a 2v2 scenario here for the Southwest. We have Prugler and Maverick versus Signal and Clinch. We're going to start establishing a forward operating base and lines. We do have a small outpost over here to the west. The tri-land facility setup with an additional PD using the... Actually using the land facilities as essentially just bullet sponges for that PD to survive as long as it can. Very interesting move. But again, if Team 1 notices it, they will probably take that out here sooner. And they do know there are some units there, so I wouldn't be surprised if they deal with that. And still, Plasma being thrown at one another constantly. Kabanov now in the yellow. And it does look like the UEF Commander of Luker is leading the hit points by just honestly by about 100 to 200 hit points. That's it. That's not a lot of hit points to be between the two comms. You know, it could, again, be a, like a murder-suicide situation here in the middle, so we're going to have to watch out for that. Surprisingly, Team 2 has not pushed their advantage with commanders. Obviously, Drunk Warden isn't going to use his comm to build a lot of units or structures because he's focused on air supremacy, but he is on the front line. And does he just straight up retreat? He does, probably, probably noticing that Team 1's air player does not move to assist, thinking he's better suited in his main base. And honestly... Uh, it's kind of a coin toss. Maybe it'd be better. Maybe it wouldn't be better. But I don't really know. We do have a small attempt to probe the defenses here for Team 1's player of Signal Runner. Going after these Team 1 mexes and units. But he's going to be caught. And that is not going to go well for his little strikers and snoops. Calm of Luca rooted to the spot on an upgrade. Kavanov has not started an upgrade as of yet. I feel like once that upgrade finishes, it will give him a nice advantage. Luker specifically uh, will give him a nice advantage to throw his opponent off of that middle section. We have lots of upgrades here for both players going for gun. They're Cybern and Seraphim, respectively. They have the same type of upgrade. It is the speed and range. They can fire it faster and shoot from farther. But Clinch already has his up gun upgrade and now going for stealth. Trying to be nice uh, and stealthy. Probably should have a stealth boy on his commander to help assist in that. But uh, he's going to essentially build a permanent one. We'll have to see. Maybe he'll go for nano, but uh, it's a little early for that. Maybe he'll wait. But T2 on the way for signal runner does make sense. He is the UEF commander. Wants to be very tanky. Team 1 does have to worry about this approach to the west. They have to put something over here just to dissuade these units incoming. This radio installation would be... Not the best position to be in, honestly. It gave a nice, you know, area of intel, but not wasn't greatly positioned. Didn't have any forces or structures surrounding it. But we do have Luca using that commander with his gun upgrade to almost kill Kabanov entirely. Sub fifteen hundred hit points. He will evet. He will ev not evacuate. He will. There's the word. Yesterday still trump me. It's not evacuate. It's evict. Ah, that's the word for it. He will evict his opponent from the middle and push his advantage northward against Trigram here to the north. A couple of bombers over the top to try to slow his roll. But he is going to keep going. Trigram does have his... He doesn't have the full sniper commander. He has the first range and the speed, but not the second. 
We do see some wall sections trying to stave off enemy incursions, but that can only last so long. And now we have a combined push from Team 2's players here on the southwest section of the map. Lynch is outnumbered. And he's being surrounded. Maverick will probably secure the first kill of the game. Clinch below 2,500 hit points and falling quite rapidly. He needs a rank of veterancy. Shift his focus onto other units and get that HP boost, but it doesn't matter. That is the first kill of the game, and it is secured, and it is secured by Team 2, making this game now a 5v4 in their favor. It does look like who will get... Uh, Kabanov will inherit that base for right now. I wouldn't be surprised if it gets handed off two signal runners because he is on that front line on that western side way i killed this i don't know what this but but looks at t3 is on the way here for hell virus and t2 also has been completed and is pumping out Cor corsair as we do have the t3 upgrade here for the column of drunk warden as well so both players in the rear guard air slots pretty much on pace we have a couple of Corsairs on their way. The combo signal runner is on their retreat. Two comms on team two pushing heavily. This is very dangerous. It is a 10 by 10. So it's not absurdly a long distance, but it can matter as time goes on. But Maverick eats a bunch of Corsair fire. Team two needs some AA in the form of airships or some you know, ground-based AA, and they're not getting it right now. These Corsairs just have carte blanche to take out anything and everything. Maverick doing his best to dodge, but he can only dodge for so long. It's really hard to micro and retreat at the same time. We have Maverick dodging, but there's so many shots coming in. We do have a T2AA mobile gun platform on its way. Maverick is below 4,000 hit points. A couple more Corsairs come in. Oh, it's not going to look good. We have some interceptors trying to assist and some interceptors here for team two trying to take those corsairs out maverick is in the red sub 3000 hit points that flak is doing a decent amount of work here sub 2500 hit points and a lot of those corsairs have already been taken out and now oh it's sub oh it's sub 1400 hit points sub a thousand couple more bombing runs and it will be a kill here for team one tying this game back up a couple of team one bombers are on their way and now it's sub 500 hit points. There goes the Corsair fire, and there it goes. It is a kill here for Team 2, tying it back up to a 4v4. His base will be inherited by Luker, and that's going to put a lot of resources in the highest rated player's hands. He's already conquering the middle of the map with assistance from a 1-0 cat. We have, of course, Kabanov trying to hold off on this middle section. Team 2 really working that mass that mass, that land advantage. You can see essentially 50% of the map just southward is controlled by them, let alone a couple of sections in the middle and this eastern side. Team 1 needs a victory in the land game, and 1 PD is not going to hold off this incursion of Mantises, and that is going to feel not super great here for Team 1. They are bleeding everywhere down the middle to the right-hand side, if not just a little bit in the left-hand side. Specifically, triads being built, trying to stave off the incoming Cybern Commander. And they are using the stealth upgrade. They can't be spotted unless vision is on them or they're in an omni range, one of the two. And Sukna Runner is going to be the main target here. You can see the units coming in from the west here from Prugler, but Sukna Runner does retreat behind is PD that he is constantly building more and more triads are being spammed up and a couple of gunships are on their way these uh, renegades and more Corsairs are on the way Prugler you should have learned your lesson from your friend and that is another kill by team one bringing this game to a 4v3 and now in their favor so now we have you know essentially Luke are going to own essentially the entire western side of Team 2's main base. That's a lot of eco. And speaking of eco, at 12 minutes, we are at 800. Wait, no, that's not right. There we go. That makes more sense. We're at 200 mass a second. I was like, there's no way it's 800 at 13 minutes. There's no way. T3 error has been achieved by both teams. Not one team ahead in that. Uh, they have a secondary one. Yeah, they're building about the same. Maybe Team 2 is slightly faster, but 
not the end of the world here. If it was like a couple minutes, it would be a lot, but let's say 30 seconds or so, not the biggest deal. There's even a whaler in here with some jesters, but there's a lot of AA, AA, zero cat, and sorry, one zero, not zero one, but one zero cat and Luker have learned their lessons from their teammates to the west, and they have AA already built up. Kambanov trying to push. This is a very risky play. You have the two comms here to the south can easily come back and take out Kabanov. And he is taking out all of those T1 and T2 units. He's at one rank of veterancy, working his way to a second. Overcharge into those pillars would have been quite nice, but uh, it's focusing a little bit more on those other T1 spam. We do have Tragam coming in for some assistance as well. He has a rank of veterancy as well. We are seeing more and more PD being built. Kabanov needs to get out of range of those triads or it's not going to be a good day here for him. Fode forever says Maverick. R read real empty slot. I didn't know that drunken is so... Well, to be fair, he was working on his T3, so... I mean, it, it's kind of hard. He was... I mean, again, Maverick, you were past the middle point pushing your advantage, which... You know, you probably is a smart thing to do, except you didn't have any AA. I feel like if you had some AA already built up, you would have been fine. But you didn't, so it's kind of hard to say it's somebody else's fault when he may course their back. Uh, I see it too late. Prugler, yeah. You see, at least Prugler's like, yeah, I admit, you know, I saw that too late. I probably should have left. But uh, just, you know, just accosting somebody else just because you died. Not really the best look, honestly. But we are having Kabanov fight off this incoming force of T1 and T2 units here from Team 2. We have some Ilshis in the mix and some Pillars. And this is going to start feeling not great here for Kabanov. He's getting a lot of veterancy, though. He's at his second rank and pretty close to his third. But those Ilshis just pummeling that commander, dropping his hit points quite rapidly. He does have the Nano. 88 hit points a second with Trigam coming in to help assist. He has a Obsidian. That'll soak up a decent amount of damage. We have more and more Corsairs and more and more Bombers coming in from Kabanov. He is the secondary air player here for Team 1 while Hellvirus gets his eco situated for mass ASF production. Team 2, they are doing very similar things. Luca building some Corsairs as well wants to use that same strategy and in terms of comms left alive we still have one uh, let's see one siren for team one one siren for team two so they both have telemazer currently but if another siren player dies on other team that team does not have access to that ab i wouldn't say ability but that strategy units grouping around this mass here in the middle what looks like the uh it's gone Come down a little bit with the death of everything and whatnot. We're about 11,000, which isn't terrible. We have a T1, sorry, T1, T3 Whaler here from the player of, tr I was going to say Trigam, but that's not Trigam. That is Drunk Warden going after some mechs. It doesn't even kill a T2 mechs. Intercept is trying to do their best here. And we have ASF trying to protect them. Uh, are they going to actually get that Whaler? No, they don't, but they almost did. Well, less than half his hit points are gone. That is pretty good considering it's T1 Inties. We are having a Colossus already planned here by Tragam. He wants to get into that experimental game quite quickly and try to puncture one or two of these main base, or at least the forward operating bases for Team 2. Do we have any sort of experimental push? That is a mass storage. That is not... I think it is... Uh, no... This looks like it's just Team 1. and But Team 1 really suffering under the threat of these Rhinos here. Sigma Runner will be able to stave off a lot. But we are seeing a mix of, of course, Cybern technology everywhere here for Team 2. Of course, Luker has access to Cybern, Aeon, sorry, Cybern, Cybern, UEF, and Seraphim. So he's kind of mixing in everything. Ilshi's very good. Pillars, Rhinos, very good units. You mix them in. One has the fire rate, one has the DPS, and then just get obsidians in there and you just tank all of the damage. <laughs> no, not one faction has all the tool or the best tools, but you combine them all. Now you have all the best tools for all the best scenarios. 
It now has the advantage with ha having access to everything. That GC, not a lot of priority on it, but it is going pretty quickly. It's already at almost 16,000, almost 20% of the way there. Oh, just to, just to kind of rant for two seconds, why is it 99,999 and not just 100,000? Like, who was the guy that, like, decided no with those, not perfectionists, but those, like, uh, OCD, like, why is it not just 100,000? Why is it 99999? <laughs> it's just my little rant for a couple of seconds. She's like, why? Why are you like this? <laughs> to the E shield going on the way for 1-0. He does have the advanced range. He's going for shield. He's going for mass aggressive plays with his commander. Again, it's double-edged sword. You got to be very careful with that because if you're more on the front lines, harder to retreat and harder to, uh, you know, uh, you're going to, the more further, farther you go, the longer it takes you to get back. The longer it takes you to get back, the more likelihood you're going to get sniped. So, you know, it is a risky play. When it pulls off, it works very well. We are seeing some T3 mobile artillery here. Very interesting play. We usually don't even see a lot of those, especially from the Aeon play where it's just mass uh, harbingers. We're seeing a lot of Oblivion tanks here at this forward operating base protecting some mexes. There's a giant wall with a couple of cuts in it, so some units can get in, but uh, Gil Walls says Maverick, yep. Trying to evade this northeastern side. Team 1 is definitely going to be aware of that once those disappear. We're having a counter push by Team 1's combined forces of Signal Runner and Trigon. Trigon providing the T3 assault bots from the Harbingers and the shields while we have some pillars and other parashields here from Signal Runner. But it's also Optims as well. And some Rhinos, and what is this? Though? Yeah, that's the say. I was going to say Seraphim. And UEF Tech, again, mixing all of the different types of advantages. This force has to retreat with the presence of all of these forces, especially when they're surrounding a base with shields and more reinforcements coming in all the time. This produ production facility should be a nice target, but it is being idle, so maybe they won't use it as much. But we'll have to see as time goes on. ASF's fighting over the top of the main base here for Team 1. Team 2 looks like they are in the lead, trying to airlock Team 1, which kind of works if you have a lot of air, but if you don't have a lot of air, then it doesn't really work because then all they have to do is just switch production to SAM sites, and then it's like, well, all that air is gone now. So, but they are leading with about, I'd say, like 13, 15 or so. Let's get an exact number. 8.16. Oh, that was close. This forward base is taken out by 1-0. And we're seeing more and more missile launchers and engineers just reclaiming all these walls to open up a path for friendly units. We're seeing those forces here from Trigam trying to come and intercept possibly units coming in from the eastern side. They know this base is gone now. They know there's something over there. How is that Colossus doing? Well... It's in the yellow, actually almost close to the green, very close to 75%. So that'll be probably the first experimental build at 21 minutes. That's for, you see, that's pretty early, but we also have a crab being built by Luca. But Luca has 400, almost 500 mass a second. Kind of interesting that that isn't built even faster. Maybe he's focusing on other things, which is, to be fair, probably is. There is a bombing run opportunity here for him as well with some Corsairs. He doesn't want to be caught unawares or at least tries to go after. Maybe Silver Runner would be a good grab. There's not a lot of shielding. There's a couple of AA, but not a whole lot. Builds a couple of maybe strap bombers and calls it a day with that, but we'll have to see with what he does with it. He has the ability to snipe. He's not using it as of yet. Again, he is running three bases, so that's a lot of ego. Team 1, in terms of mass, is just barely behind by probably about 30 or so mass, roughly, with Team 2 leading at 14,000 mass total. So, again, especially because Team 2 has one player with three bases, that's not actually that bad, considering. Because, obviously, the more mass you have, the easier it is to upgrade. The easier it is to upgrade, the more you can, you know, upgrade faster and 
went up, but here comes that bombing run onto Silk the Runner. He's rooted to the spot on an upgrade. He's in the yellow. Does he cancel it? He might have to. Yep, there's the cancel. That's going to suck all that wasted mass. ASF's coming in to help assist. Silk the Runner has to get out of there. Corsairs are pretty much destroyed, and now the land force will come in and finish off this forward operating base here. He spent all that time and energy to build it, and now it's just gone to shreds. ASFs from Team 2 come and kill the ASFs from Team 1. Team 2 still has air control, essentially air dominance at this point. But again, 23 minutes is kind of early for air dominance. It's really easy to come back in the game from that. Unless all your air facilities are gone, then that's different. We're already seeing some PD. Just hold that floodgate back just a little bit. You see all those triads open fire. We have a couple of missile launchers as well. ASF's flying over the top to protect these units. They want to push in, but there's a lot of PD on this front line. A couple of T1s as well. And they and these Othams are in range. That if they want to deal damage, they have to move forward, but they don't want to move. Takes out an Otham with that missile. Good targeting here by Team 1's player of Signal Runner. And man, it's just kind of quiet. But on this eastern side, the army to the east is pushing. There's a lot of PD being spammed up. It does come into range of those Harbingers. They need to retreat. Use the range to their advantage, or at least use the Obsidians to tank the damage. That's a lot of PD, though. They need some artillery, I feel like. And the Serenity is nearby, but should have just stayed put. But we have the Colossus coming, and that's what they were probing for. We have some of those Miasmas also targeting this eastern base as well, trying to do that AoE damage as they do. And they're actually going after this middle line as well. Team 2 is going to claim that for now. They don't want Team 1 re, you know, resetting up shop. There's four Maxis here. It's a nice chunk of mass that either team can use. Team 2, if they can't have it, will at least deny it against their opponents. And, it, you know, denying mass is almost as important as getting it because if you can't have it, no one can kind of thing. All that... PD is gone. It's done and dusted. This little base is going to be open for business. Colossus is going to charge forth. There's not a lot of PD like there is on this western base with all of the PD and artillery. It's going to be a while to take through that chunk, not chunk through, go through that base. And this Colossus is going to gain more and more mass killed per second. There's a couple of Oblivion turrets, but like I said earlier, it's not going to last very long. Now with assisting forces coming in, to come and just bulldoze their way through. Team 2 needs a response. They need a monkey or a chicken or a crab or something, but we have Team 2's air player building a bug. Uh, I don't know about that. I feel like a monkey would be a lot more effective here. This eastern side is going to be essentially wiped out, and maybe those go straight south and take out 1-0. That could be a move here, and that might be where they're going. Let's check this, the shift key. The shift key says yes, they are moving southward. That might be the plan is to come in around the right side. And while at the same time that is happening, a push to the west is occurring. There's not an experimental here. Well, there's one back here, I should say, but not on the front line. Looks like the runner is under threat. He needs to start retreating once he gets that T3 upgrade finished. He doesn't want to risk, you know, having to build it a third time. But this experimental will, is in the main base, essentially here, for Team 2's player of 1-0. Core mass is a main target. Taking out engineers for defenses would also be a good thing. There goes those Oblivion turrets. Just tissue paper. Just shredding everything in his way. Oh, and he's going he after the calm of 1-0. Oh, is he going to get him before the Colossus dies? No, he will not get out of range. And that is another kill for Team 1. It's now a 4v2. Luca will get the remains of what is left of 1-0's base. But a second crab does finish. The Colossus is just going to barrel forward. Taking out the air grid would also be a great thing for Team 1 to get. And that is what Team 2 is trying to prevent. Prevent cat. You, wow, okay, Maverick, stop throwing shade at all your other teammates. It's not cool, dude. Okay, you got to take out this Pigeon and then take out the other one. It has only 500 hit points left. Will he take it out? Yes, he does. Oh, man, this air grid is essentially wiped out that Colossus does fall after a long barrage on that eastern side look at everything that's just dead team 2 is trying to follow a similar suit but 
because they're distracted with the eastern side, they're letting things, you know, not where they be as effective as they could. And now it's just bombardment by T1 bombers. This base is being shredded. This is the main base here for Sukno Runner, but Team 2 has been inflicted with a grievous wound. Air Grid is essentially shot. An entire space worth of mass is gone. Here comes the air to support, but this is all the air they have. It's going to take a while to rebuild all this. ASFs are going to go after, I think, the bombers, it looks like. Mm, let's see, what are they targeting? To? Yeah, they're going after the bomb. It's hard to tell because it's kind of just a mass of colors. But, again, even if Team 1 loses the air fight, it's going to take Team 2 a while to rebuild it. So it's still an air win regardless. And it does look like it'll be both. It'll be an air win... Uh, mostly, but this Colossus, the Colossus, the Crab is still alive. T3 land headquarters is taken out. Signal Runner is on the retreat, building some Ravagers to help assist in defense. Megalith still online, getting a lot of veterancy, but again, this it's just not, it's not going to go well. Team 1 looks like they secure air victory. Not dominance, but at least a victory. And there's a lot of SMD built here. We see a nuke. That is why Team 1 doesn't have as much air. They're pummeling it into a nuke. And that's... Honestly, it... It might actually work... If Team 2 doesn't notice. Does Team 2 notice? That's the question. Uh, no. And they don't have any SMD. And it's almost 30 minutes. You should build at least an SMD around 30 minutes. A lot of players, some players do like to rush nukes, but usually when you see SMDs being built by one team kind of early on, usually that means that they're building a nuke or at least thinking about building a nuke. The calm of Kabanov coming to assist in defense of his base. And it, this is a very interesting strategy. It's T1 air factories, not T3, and then they're putting T3 pigeons in between them, probably going to upgrade after the fact, most likely which is, again, a very interesting play. You usually don't see that. Usually it's just T3 all the way, but maybe he knows something that I don't. Maybe that's a possible new strat. Who knows? But we'll have to see if it works for him or not. There's only two players left on Team 2, but I guess there's only three players. Technically, Signal Run is essentially out of the game. He only has one mass a second, so he doesn't really have anything going for him. He has to restart, essentially. Another crab going to start assaulting this base, but there's a lot of miasmas here. That crab is going to start feeling it. T2 artillery is a very good counter to... Me I was going to say mexes, but experimentals because they move so slowly. But the shields are starting to buckle for this base, and there goes some miasmas. But they've already taken a lot of damage. This crab is going to be under 50% hit points, and there's also a Colossus en route, so Team 2 really either needs to decide to push forward or leave. He decides to leave, and that's just going to either open the floodgates or just reinvigor Team 1's player of Trigram to just reinforce this, reinforce this position even more. The Colossus, the, Colossus, the Colossus is coming in range. It is slowly narrowing that gap. But the Megalith is sub 40,000. It's not useless, but it's essentially useless. We do have more pushing to the west by some bricks. But again, they can't really do a whole lot. Not three of them. Maybe if you had 30 of them. But uh, Team 2 isn't putting a lot of effort to the western side. This is where all their effort is currently. And their Othams, Sea Tanks, and the Perseus are just going to be eradicated by this Colossus. Team 1 is really turning around. Team 2 lost one player earlier on, and then they got a kill, then they lost a player, and then they got another... No, they only got one kill, and then Team 1 got another kill, and then another kill. So there's a lot of forward momentum here for Team 1. Looks like the Corsairs went after a... P gen, but the, re the reclaim order came off just in time for the AoE volatile explosion to be negated. Team 2 now has a fat boy that'll shove the Colossus off of its uh, main, you know, attempt to go after the crab. But again, if that, Col that Colossus, that crab gets in range of these miasmas, it's not going to feel good. Team 1 is rebuilding them. He probably needs like two more shields. 
probably one here and one here just to help protect a lot more but you could build t3 as well but you know, again i'm not the one playing i'm the one casting so sometimes uh cast is no best and sometimes we're just like well i would do this but again i'm not the one playing so who's to say but again another wave of t1 bombers in route they take out a lot of hit points still on the yellow though but and i feel like it's more of just buying time there's some russian text don't know what that says anybody in the comments can let me know what that says but uh i can't translate on the fly like this because i just if i try to copy paste it'll just you know click off screen and minimize the game which is i get it it's an older game newer games have the ability to click off screen without having to worry about the game closes but i wish faf would do that i wish faf would have the ability to say if you click off screen you still stay on as like what because i have this is my middle screen stay on my middle screen and not minimize so yeah it's just one of those you know because i have multiple screens to you know record and stuff it's just would be nice to be able to like oh let me uh highlight copy paste see what it says but i can't do that realistically in a recording session unlike this or at least in the format that i do in it i should say but Team 1 almost has the nuke finished. It actually is about to finish the nuke. Team 2 still doesn't have an SMD that I can see. Oh, there's one right here. Not loaded. This would be a great position to drop it. You're taking out a disruptor. You're taking out land facilities, PGENs, T2 air headquarters. Huge grab. But we do have a chicken from the western side, but against two crabs and a fat boy, that's not going to go well. The chicken is focused more on taking out the mass which i feel like is probably a better investment there's even that buck that just finished well not just finished but that has been finished t3 on the way here for drunk warden again t1 pushing a lot more on the land side of things they want to exert more dominance team 2 is still holding on just due to the fact that there's no infrastructure for team 1 to really you know they haven't built up infrastructure and team 2 can just you know walk over take it out and leave so not really the uh, best scenario but that nuke has finished the sooner they launch it the better because the longer they wait the more likely that anti-nuke is loaded they need to load an anti says clinch yep it's right here they need to launch it they need to launch it now there's even of course that disruptor that is on that is coming online they know it exists but they need to take it out Sooner rather than later. There's another SMD. Yeah, they are getting SMD up and running quick. The time is now for that nuke. You're not going to have a better opportunity than now. But, again, every second that passes, it's not building well for them. See how close it is. Well, it's now two-thirds, well, almost two-thirds of the way there. They're not assisting. But now they're heavily assisting that disruptor. Look at that thing go. Hundreds of hit points a second. Man. A lot of eco devoted to that thing. We are seeing more and more, you know, fat boys and crabs pushed out to try to exert dominance over the eastern side of the map. Oh, let's see. I think that, I th honestly, I think that anti nuke will finish before the nuke is loaded. Honestly, at this point, a lot of emphasis is on that disruptor. It's not shielded. The little gripe, you should at least put one shield around it. Because all team two has, to, or team one has to do is see it and go, oh, that's a. Oh, we can just shoot that with our artillery or whatever. Two signal runs credit. He is coming back in the game. He's at 60 mass now, so he's, you know, starting to hold his own now. Building a lot of SAM sites that wants to protect himself and his allies here in the northwestern side. Team 1 has their own bug. What is up with building Strategic bugs this early? But the nuke finishes and it, not finishes, but releases its payload. And that's not a great spot. Ah, uh, that's... Mass, please, can you give me some more mat? Oh, that's so disappointing. The SMD isn't even loaded. This disruptor is in the yellow to be a huge grab. It's trying to go after the air, maybe? I don't know his goal with that. I mean, he's going to kill a section of it, but not really a whole lot. It does essentially absolutely nothing. Go, says Maverick. He says go forward, but there is a crat in the crab. There's a bug nearby. Not a lot of AA in this mix. These fat boys can produce units on the go. We have two crabs chasing after an explosion. That's really rarely that you see that. But there's a third crab to the west with a bug. 
The Colossus is coming into the main base here for Team 1. Luker is on the retreat. His disruptor is half completed. His anti-nuke isn't even loaded. But they're loading it more and more, of course, because they are in fear of the enemy nukes. That Colossus honestly isn't even going to get a lot of work done. He's going to try to reach that main base, but will try kind of struggle to do so. And there it goes. Luker really had nothing to fear there. Kind of a waste of a Colossus, honestly. It didn't it honestly took one mass extractor out. That's about it. And that's just a mass gift for Team 2. Hopefully that does not bite Team 1 in the butt for that. Do we have any sort of artillery? Yep, we have an emissary. It's halfway done. Do we have anything else here for Team 1? Uh, oh, they're building another another artillery. That's one Hubatham, two Hubathams. Oh, one emissary, one Hubatham. For Team 1. The disruptor isn't even in the green. Uh, okay, never mind. It's in the green now. That's a lot of build power. That's a lot of build power focusing on that. The bug here for Team 1 comes in. And honestly, it's just going to die straight up. Man, that's just Team 1 is just throwing them away at this point. You know, two experimentals died, essentially doing nothing. Drunk Warden completed, completes another experimental. I think that was the bug. Yep, that was the bug being built. And the ASFC for Team 1 might just engage the bug itself. That bug is now in the yellow. The new bug, the newly minted bug, is just not newly minted anymore. ASF is not really strong here for Team 2. There's some you know, AA in the area, but not a whole lot. That bug is the main target. A lot of this ASF will fly over some SAM sites. That bug might just die. Oh, it's going to be close. Does Team 1 score the kill above the air grid? Missiles away constantly. It survives on 4,000 hit points. Man, that's, uh, that's not great. But Team 1 has finished their Hubatham. And it's going to start opening fire on that base. How's that emissary? It's in the green, so it'll have two artillery online. Team 2 does have their disruptor as well. They're getting omnis and shields all the time. Focus says trigram and says move says uh, something. There, I don't think there was a. I don't know what that was about? Oh, move saying to the the bombers to move. Where they get the uh, the pigeons because it assists with reload and I think it does accuracy too. I keep saying it does. I feel like it does, but I could be wrong. But the artillery is focusing on the air grid. The first shot lands with no issue. Here comes the second one. Takes out a, I think that was a uh, radar. Ooh, actually hits the bug. So <laughs> 4,000 hit points now. That bug almost dies to artillery. Oh, these so close to being down. One more artillery will take out essentially this whole section. Oh, just barely clips that one. One more shot will do it. Just want to see the big explosions. There it comes. There it goes. Kaboom. Air grid is now split up in half. What is this disruptor firing at for Team 1? Well, I'm assuming it would be the other air grid. No, it's taking out some mass fab farms for Team 1. There's not really an air grid here for Team 1. Just a couple of T1s, a couple of T3 over here. But usually this is where you would think a lot of the air grid would be. But there's not really anything here. We do have a push on the ground by Team 2 with a crab and a bunch of bricks. And some Seraphim shields, and some Hothams, and some Percy. So again, a mixing of technologies. We also have another crab pushing the western side of that mountain. With the artillery raining in constantly. I don't know what they're going after. Pigeons, maybe? Maybe that's what they're going after against Lucre. Well, they're building more Pigeons as we speak. Oh, maybe... Th oh, they're going after the SMBs. Okay. I was like, what are they going after? Does Team 1 have the nuke? Well, it's gone anyway, so it doesn't really matter. There's actually an emissary being built here by Virus as well. So three players potentially getting into that artillery game. There goes that. Those mass fab farms, they're all up in smoke. This monkey needs to get to that front line to help assist in defense. The first crab falls. There is a Colossus here to assist. That Colossus will die. There's two bugs inbound. First one, of course, is already almost dead. The second one about to die. Oh, sorry, the first one 
Almost dead. Oh, that one's going to land right on top of Sigma Runners. That's going to hurt. Here comes the second one. It's going for... I don't know what it's going for. Maybe Kabanoff? I don't really know. Yeah, it's going after Kabanoff, but... Uh, doesn't get the kill for that. Lots of shielding. Ravagers being built nearby. Still going to run a two assist and defense. And man, it has done a lot of work. A Colossus and a Crab have fallen. A second one will fall. The one to the east is just being bombarded by Miasmas. And I think it will die just to Miasmas itself. Yep, there's one shot. A couple more shots. Of course, they have that AoE kind of splash damage effect. Pings go down to take out the... Crab, and there it goes to Miasma Fire. More shade being thrown in the chat over here to the west side of the screen by Maverick. Again, it's kind of hard to say anything because obviously I'm not the one playing, but when you die as one of the first players and then you just crap on all of your other teammates, kind of hard to say that like you're the one in the right. Even though you might have some valid criticism, it's kind of you know, like, eh, I don't know about that kind of thing. Was there a second? Oh, for all the naming mod. I know one point one uh, viewer will be like, nope, I'm rooting for the other team because of the naming mod. But uh, how about them being built here? I thought I saw another one. Maybe that was uh, the other artillery. Yeah, it's probably just the emissary I was looking at. But Team 1 re-pushing on that. <laughs> this is the War of Engineers, essentially. Look at this. This is just... I know there's a lot going on, but there's just... Why are there... Why? <laughs> the War of Engineers just running around the map. They're not attacking each other. They're just on patrol routes. Oh, they're on attack orders, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's just funny to watch these engineers run around. Something about 140,000 mass, somebody commented. 170,000 on the map currently. It's a decent chunk. Not as much as a Paragon, but, you know, getting there. A lot of shielding around the disruptor. The second one being completed as we speak. But team one, they're pumping out another, you know, Havatham. They're also pumping out another disruptor and another emissary. Team two either needs to go in and assassinate some of these or just build them faster. But the shields are starting to buckle. They're coming on and off, but it's not looking good here for team two's artillery. Luker needs to build even more Seraphim shields. That's what's going to save him in this mess. But he has a land invasion to deal with here. Well, it's a small one, but it's still, you know, APM taxing kind of thing. There goes the artillery hitting other soft targets. We have some engineers assisting the shields all the time, but it doesn't work when the shield is completely gone. It looks like Team 1 is just going to be completely content with just hanging out. The shields are going down around this Gulf of uh, uh, Tham. Go at the Colossus pushing through the main base, not trying to stop on anything. Hell Virus is actually being directly targeted, or at least maybe it's just a coincidence. But man, that shot was really close. You can just see the rain. Just look at the arcs on these cannons just constantly raining shells down. Or I guess plasma. These are more shells, I think. Yeah, these are more shells. That's a lot of shields to chew through, though. The second disruptor is almost online. It cannot come faster for Luker. But, of course, we have to watch out for the other two being built. How's that emissary? Well, that one's in the yellow. The second hub with them is finished. Now it's three versus one. It's going to be a huge boon to Team 1. And the shields are starting to fail, and they are being taken out. More and more shields coming online, offline to help assist, but I don't know if it's going to be enough. Yep, it needs to build more T3 shielding. It needs the Seraphim variety. That second disruptor will finish. I'm just going to—I'm going to watch it tick over to complete. There it goes. Okay, it has been completed. It's now 3v2. There's a small little band of mech marines on this eastern side, just being annoying. For Team Two, wants to just tax the APM. Again, that is something that you can do to win the game is just sit there and just tax the APM of your opponents. Just be like, you can't do any actions because you're too worried about, you know, all these ten different things. The shields still trying to hold strong. They come on and off all the time, but there's one good shot. Takes out two emitters. It pops back on just in the nick of time. That PGN was very close to going down. 
The artillery really starting to take its toll. Team 2 needs to push, and they need to push now. But team 1's just going to turtle more and more. You know, having that nuke would have been way more useful had Team 1 used it against the early disruptor being completed. But, again, hindsight is twenty twenty. but I was also commenting about it in the moment. So, what is that, like, 40-40 vision? Where it's like it's you can say it in the moment and after the moment? Look at that. The shields just cannot hold. Luker actually getting a little bit too close to that artillery fire. The mass amounts of T3 units moving northward is crazy, but Team 1 is going to hold with as much defenses as they can. Essentially, it's just how long can they hold. Air grid starting to fall for Team 1, but they're going after Luker specifically, it looks like, or just taking out some T3 facilities, one of the two. They should be focusing on the artillery like they should have been doing, or they should be doing all the time, but... Uh, Clinch making a comment in chat to make tele-defense. It's probably a smart idea. The second emissary is now completed, and there is going to be a lot of tele-defense for Team 1. The shields around Luker are falling. He is retreating. He is the main target for that artillery, and he needs to move as fast as he can. You can see the artillery just rain in constantly. Four shells or four plasma rounds moving across the map for Team 1. Luker just trying to hold just a, a marriage of technology here. We have Seraphim shields, UEF shields. I guess the UEF shields are all dead, but uh, UEF commander. Just all of the different types. Oh, there it goes. Nice. Oh, he was close to that. There goes the Seraphim shields. He needs to keep those online. Those are the most important. Essentially, you know, those are the best shields in the game. You know, full stop. There's no really, you know, fighting that, uh, that opinion on my end. That's just the way I feel and the way I've seen it in other people's comments. It's just they are the best. A lot of uh, shields being built here by Team 1 as well. And they're all Seraphim. I feel like this position would be easier to crack. There's a lot more, not say more of P gens, but there's more, I guess, opportunities because the... Aeon shields are not as strong. But the push with a bunch of T3 units, there are a bunch of Harbs in here, and they're just going to go full bore, full send it down the middle of the map, running into Harbingers as we speak. And again, the comm is targeted constantly by Team 1's artillery, at least the ones here from the player of... Let's see, is that... That's Kavanaugh, right? Yeah, it's Kavanaugh. I don't know about the artillery... Uh, no, I guess it's the same target here for Ragram as well. But again, this bug is on its way to help assist. Is there any AA in the mix? There really isn't. That's really only going to go away. Only going to go one way if Team One doesn't change. But there's also a Colossus inbound. It's being pinged furiously by Team Two. The shields, oh, starting to buckle. There goes an emitter. Ooh, shields come back online. Just barely one artillery is down. The overwhelming pressure from the artillery is just overwhelming. We have strap bombers coming in to help assist, but it can only hold off so much. We have Team 1 fervors assisting with taking out Mexes. How's the Ecos going? Well, Team 1 is in the lead by a decent chunk now. You can see the slow collapse of Team 2's empire just slowly just, you know, grouping into the southeastern side of the map. The Colossus actually stops moving. Uh, kind of a bad play, but one of the artilleries is down. The second one is almost not even shielded at this point. I feel like all Team 1 has to do is just sit back, relax, cook some popcorn, and just watch the fireworks from far away. That disruptor is still being built by Team 1's player of Hell Virus, and Hell Virus has actually just not really focused on air. Either has, you know, a really anybody for Team 1. A couple of gunships, but that's it. At least currently, they're more focused on the artillery. And honestly, Team 1, or sorry, Team 2, they're trying to do so much. They're trying to do land, trying to do air, trying to do artillery. And it's just, they're bleeding everywhere. More comments being made in Russian by Maverick. So you can just see the devastation. We have a missile battery here by Team 1's player of Kabanov going after the artillery directly. That's a good snipe. Takes out that other emplacement. 
shields going down constantly around Luca. Luca is just not not a happy camper here. He's just stuck. Cannot go anywhere. Now we have the artillery focusing on the air grid, or at least the calm of Drunk Warden. He has one shield around him. Hits Cyber, and it's not great. And you can just see, look at all these shells. We have, what, one, two, almost three, four, five, uh, almost four, five, six artillery, possibly. That's a, that's a lot of, that's a lot of firepower. Four, says Kabanoff. Maybe he's talking about artillery. But Trunk Warden is just hanging out with his little flak and shield. Not really having really any cares in the world. There comes one. It impacts next to him. He drops into the red with just one shot due to the AOE lingering effect from those emissaries. And is it going to be an artillery kill? Luker is leaving the shield barrier. He wants to probably go out in a blaze of glory. Missiles coming in all the time targeting those PGNs. Don't know how this is going to go. Oh, that shot impacts, takes out a group of engineers next to him. Everything is dying around him. Drunk Warden just trying to hold on for dear life. Artillery constantly raining in. But he's trying to push northward. He takes everything you have and just sends it. And he's doing a pretty good job right now. But that's a lot of, lot of defenses to get through. We also have these fervors to the north just being annoying, taking out some mexes and the like but there's no shield around Luker except for his shield on his commander all the shields are essentially down nearby this is the only one left standing for now we also have drunk warden just kind of wandering around his base so he doesn't get sniped by artillery but the artillery has stopped firing oh no they've changed targets and going after the land spam Oh, three artillery targeting the fat boy. Its shields are down. It's almost dead. Oh, it's trying to... Oh, that was close. It's going to run in. Ooh. Oh. Oh, it gets killed by the emissary lingering effect. Ooh, that's got to hurt. That is essentially the whole push by Team 2. They have essentially nothing. But there goes the calm of Luker. He decides to control K. That was his last opportunity to get anything done and just the defenses were too strong. Drunk Warden didn't even go for a telemazer attempt. And now it's just going to be artillery. I'm going to speed it up just a little bit. Just one. And now it does look like Team 2 is targeting the comm. Or at least they know it's somewhere around here. But they're just taking out the air grid. But we have fervors coming in all the time. Ravagers in the main base here for Drunk Warden. Just trying to stave off enemy incursions. But it's just more and more artillery raining in. There's another field gone down. Maverick complaining about everybody but Luker. But oh, Drunk Warden's gonna. Oh, there's a Pigeon. You gotta get out of there. Ooh, oh, there goes the Pigeon explosion. He's in the red. One more shell will kill him. And that's a kill by Team One's artillery. Who was it? It's not gonna tell me who got it. That's. Annoying, but man, that was a very good game. A lot of back and forth. There was a missed opportunity with the nuke launcher earlier on. It didn't end up mattering, but, you know, it could have mattered. He actually started building a Scathus, too. Like, well, why not? Why not build a Scathus? But in terms of underrated player of the game, I mean, I feel like Kamenov gets it. I mean, Luca held out for a long time because he had three bases and he was able to push on multiple sides. But I feel like Kabanov was able to hold back just enough to build those artillery, at least the first one. Look, the runner was assisting with the main southern baseline defense. Really, it was, you know, Kabanov did a good job. Trigram did a good job. I feel like Hell could have gone more into the air game. Like, he really didn't build a lot of an air grid as he probably should have. But air didn't really matter a whole lot in the end. I think it was just due to the fact that Drunk wasn't putting as much of an emphasis on it. But again, let me know how you feel about the game, how it turned out. Hit that like button, comment down below. Again, what your favorite moment was. Do you agree with me with the opinion of Kamenov being the underrated player of the game? And of course, if you haven't hit that sub button and you've been enjoying this video or just my content in general, please, I encourage you to do so. I greatly appreciate every single one of you. 
for doing so. And obviously those for just watching too. I know somebody, some people will never sub and that's completely fine. Keep enjoying my content. I greatly appreciate that at the least. And again, thank you so much for watching and I will see all of you in the next one.